presentación del ciclo Frankenstein, 200 años en la historia de la ciencia, eh, coloquio, ciclo de coloquios de la Sociedad Catalana de Historia de la Ciencia y de la Técnica, también con el apoyo del eh, CEIC, Centro de Historia de la Ciencia. Y hoy es la segunda conferencia y tenemos a Tim uh, Falford, que es profesor eh, de Humanidades en uh, The Montfort University, uh, es especialista de la literatura romántica y los contextos del colonialismo y la exploración, la ciencia y la religión, el paisaje y lo pintoresco. Tiene dos libros que son apasionantes, Romantic Indians, los indios románticos, Native Americans and Transatlantic Literary Culture, y otro que es Literature, Science and Exploration in the Romantic, uh, in the romantic Era. Y ahora está eh, preparando uh, las, uh, una edición de las cartas de Humphrey Davy, que se publican en Oxford University Press. And just, uh, it's already uh, in press? Or just the... about in press, yes, next okay. week. So almost in press. Bueno, so it's a pleasure to, to welcome you. Uh, thanks for having me. I made yes. a small introduction. And, uh, well, we look forward to, uh, to your talk. Bienvenido. Thanks very much for inviting me, Fernando, yes. Um, since there's not too many of us here, I, I don't want it to be too rigid a divide between me behind this desk and, and you over there, although I'm going to be sitting here because I'm being filmed. So if there's anything you want to ask as I go along, or you don't understand because I'm speaking too quickly, Just put your hand up, and um, then you can take over for a bit. Um, so I'm going to talk about the novel and the culture of the period, rather than uh, about more recent films or, or other versions of Frankenstein. So I'm taking us back to the 18th century and the early 19th century to look at the culture of science and of exploration uh, at the time just before Mary Shelley Was, uh, was writing it. So as I expect you know, at the end of the novel, the creature and Frankenstein, his creator, chase each other across the frozen ocean. And this is a place of strange sights and sounds, the Arctic. It becomes apparent there that each, the creature and the creator, is the double of the other, that they are not opposite, as human is to monster, or rational to irrational, or man of science to primitive, but also they are alike. And it's the strangeness of the air in the Arctic, wrenched by shrieks, cracks, thunders, cries, and strange spectral sights that symbolizes this doubleness. This is the frame narrative, of course, narrated through the letters of the polar voyager, Walton, who's on the ship trying to find the Northwest Passage. And Walton, Walton's text, his letter, shows that he can't tell what or who he hears. This is Walton. What do these sounds portend, he says. It's midnight. The breeze blows fairly and the watch on deck scarcely stir. Again, there is a sound as of a human voice, but hoarser. It comes from the cabin where the remains of Frankenstein still lie. So I'm interested in this sound. Is this sound a human voice? Walton says, not that it is a human voice, but it's as of a human voice. Is it the voice of the creature? In which case, is it human or not? Or is it the strange sound of the Arctic, the cracking ice, or the Arctic wind? It's hard for Walton to decide what is a real material object and what is spirit or imagination is not clear in the strange polar environment. So in other words, I think the polar environment is a stage for staging visually and sonically many of the dramatic and human confrontations and uh, difficulties in the novel. So this talk's going to explore two things, the role of snow and ice in the novel, the Arctic environment. How and why did Mary Shelley come to set 
the climactic scenes of her story in the Arctic and in the Alps on a glacier. And then second, I'm going to explore the role of science in the novel. The two things meet because it was in exploring the polar regions that men of science found their science tested to and beyond its limits. Well, I'm going to begin by talking about the scientific culture of Mary Shelley's time, uh, and particularly of the, uh, the group of people uh, around Mary Shelley. As you know, by the, late environment, by the late Enlightenment period, many European elites subscribed to what we might call a technology of truth-making. By that, I mean that they agreed on various protocols which produced what they could accept as truth. Among these, perhaps the most powerful was scientific empiricism, as demonstrated by supposedly objective instruments. These instruments produced results that were tested in repeated experiments and by the response to peer-reviewed papers. We're all familiar with this scientific process now, but according to Simon Schaffer and other historians of science, it was these protocols that were being established in the 1780s and 90s in particular. Men of science, savants, distinguished themselves from speculators and from conjurers and mountebanks by demonstrating that their apparatus worked independently of their skill in manipulating it. Science was a re re used a reliable black box recording nature rather than a magician's tool. And often the course celebre in dividing the culture of science from the magician was seen to be the investigation of Mesmer in Paris uh, and the conclusion of the commission on which Franklin sat that th this was basically magician's work. So after the 1790s, the men of science wrote their reports of what they had observed increasingly with a disembodied passive voice so as to remove the appearance of subjective bias. Largely, they stopped experimenting on themselves, on their own bodies. To be objective was to be believed, and accurate, replicable measurements were the neatest signs of objectivity and observation. So it's this science of agreed procedures of empirical measurement in the novel that Waldman, the, his teacher, teaches Victor Frankenstein. So here is my first slide. The ancient teachers of this science, said he, Promised, very, promised impossibilities and performed nothing. These are the alchemists. The modern masters, on the other hand, promise very little. They know that metals cannot be transmuted and that the elixir of life is a chimera. But these philosophers, whose hands seem only made to dabble in dirt and their eyes to pore over the microscope or crucible, have indeed performed miracles. They penetrate into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. They ascend into the heavens. They have discovered how the blood circulates and the nature of the air we breathe. And I want us to notice that line, the nature of the air we breathe, since the nature of the air becomes very important in the Arctic. They have acquired new and almost unlimited powers. They can command the thunders of heaven, mimic the earthquake, and even mock the invisible world with its own shadows. That's a reference not to movies, but to the phantasmagoria and the magic lantern, as if Mary Shelley is anticipating the movies that would later be made of Frankenstein. So the kind of belief or assent produced by subscribing to these protocols was branded as an escape from superstition from the alchemists pursuing the elixir of life, an escape from cre credulous prejudice and from speculation. With their tried technology of experiment, the savant believed they could distinguish what was true from what people just assumed to be true. So here's a remark from the anatomist and surgeon John Hunter. Uh, 
that he made to his pupil Edward Jenner, the discoverer of vaccination. Hunter said to Jenner, I thank you for your experiment on the hedgehog, but why do you ask me a question by way of solving it? I think your solution is just, but why think? Why not try the experiment? So the solution to the experiment is not to speculate about it, but to try another experiment. This is the method. In the novel, Victor Frankenstein is a convert to this new science, the science of empirical observation, measurement, and replicable experiment. But, but he retains one of the characteristics of the alchemy that this science was replacing. He says, I read and studied the wild fancies of Paracelsus and Albertus Magnus with delight. They appeared to me treasures known to few besides myself. I have described myself as always having been imbued with a fervent longing to penetrate the secrets of nature. So like the alchemists, Victor has the arrogant belief that he can not only observe nature, but penetrate it and reveal its secrets. So I think this is interesting in the novel. Victor is not simply a portrait of the new man of science, the latest scientist and his dangers. He is a particular hybrid of the new man of science and the old alchemist. Victor sees the scientist as a solitary, lone genius who can experiment his way into nature's hiding places. And in this, he resembles a particular new man of science who perhaps also seemed to be fulfilling some of the dreams of the alchemists. That man of science was someone that Mary Shelley met when she was a girl. Humphrey Davy, the greatest chemist yet to have appeared in the words of Ampere. So here is Davy. He was a visitor to her father's household. So Humphrey Davy used the latest technology, the voltaic pile, or the battery, to pass electric currents through substances. This broke them down, revealing strange new elements. Davy discovered more elements than any other man of science before or since. He discovered potassium, sodium, iodine, chlorine with the voltaic pile, showing them to be at the heart of nature. So he was, in this sense, one of the modern masters, in Waldman's phrase, a master of experiment and observation. And these were spectacular experiments with a very large very obvious piece of apparatus that could act independently of the man of science. You set it going and then it produced these results independently of your skill. But Davy was also like one of the old alchemists because he portrayed the scientist as a man of sublime power, a genius who can penetrate and transform nature, not just observe it. So this is what Davy wrote in his discourse introductory to a course of lectures on chemistry. And Davy was a very popular lecturer. He was quite a sensation in London. Davy. Science has, bes has bestowed upon him, man, powers which may almost be called creative, which have enabled him to modify and change the beings surrounded him, surrounding him and by his experiments to interrogate nature with power, not simply as a scholar, passive and seeking only to understand her operations, but rather as a master, active with his own instruments. Who would not be ambitious of becoming acquainted with the most profound secrets of nature, of ascertaining her hidden operations, and of exhibiting to men that system of knowledge which relates so intimately to their own physical and moral constitution. That's quite a research program. When you're making your bids for funding, you're making the stakes very high there. You're going to discover not just the secrets of nature, but 
what relates intimately to mankind's physical and moral constitution. And Davy seemed to be, be able to realize this by the power of the battery in his hands. Potassium, sodium, these new elements were the evidence. Well, Mary Shelley, uh, still a girl, read these sentences in 1816, just two years before she wrote the novel. And she modeled Victor Frankenstein on Humphrey Davy. Humphrey Davy, also a very young man when he wrote these words, and still in his 30s when he was making his sensational discoveries of new elements. So like Victor, a young scientist, almost a young Frankenstein. An arrogant genius, as well as a careful empiricist, who saw the man of science as a solitary hero, penetrating and transforming nature. So Humphrey Davy was Mary Shelley's model for Victor. But he was not the only model. Another model was the polar explorer, the scientific traveller who penetrated to the world's remotest regions to observe nature there, going where white men never had gone before. As Bruno Latour has shown, the late Enlightenment perfected knowledge technologies that allowed repeat travel to very remote places. Voyagers contributed to agreed protocols of recording and their reports, charts, pictures and coastal profiles were gathered at metropolitan centres of calculation where they were consulted by new voyages enabling them to replicate the route and to come back safely. The centres of calculation were kind of lonely planet guides of the 18th century. The Arctic became safe repeatedly to visit in the early 19th century, or sort of safe. A lot of people died. A lot of ships did not come back. Britain's Admiralty, however, sent expedition after expedition there to find the Northwest Passage across the ice or to find the North Pole itself. And when the ships arrived to get stuck in the pack ice for months and years at a time, they experimented on everything they could. They experimented on the ice, the climate, the air, the light, the sound, the water, even the native people, the Inuits, the Eskimos. What they found, however, was that their experiments did not produce predictable results, or they failed completely to comprehend their subjects. Often, the Arctic defied the instruments. It refused to be registered on the calibrated scales. Its native people, the Inuit especially, eluded comprehension. As a result, the Arctic exposed the limitations of the scientific technologies, truth-making technologies, to which the voyagers and the men of science back at home in Europe both subscribed. Compasses led you wrong. The magnetic compass was unreliable near the North Pole. Telescopes showed the impossible. So the instruments seemed to work correctly, but the results did not agree with what they had shown everywhere else in the world. The instruments could not be believed, but nor could the voyagers disbelieve them. The explorers were left in, a, a, in an impasse, unsure of the evidence of their own senses and of the readings of their apparatus. So what I want to suggest to you today is that the Arctic was simultaneously now available, you could go there, and also resistant to investigation. And as such, it became an external representative, a kind of stage, for the fear and desire that was buried within scientific 
empiricism. The Arctic became a strange, uncanny zone because it signified the thrilling anxiety that nature might slip from science's grasp, might elude the record, escape science's power, undermine its technologies. And it has remained fascinating in the cultural imaginary of Europe for this reason, as an other, embodying fear but also longing for a world that escapes mastery by our technologies of knowledge production. And this is why people still go to cross the Arctic on foot, and of course the Antarctic as well now, solo voyages across the continent. Okay, another picture of an Arctic expedition attempting to cut its way out of the ice. The British usually, uh, British usually took two ships, as you can see here, too dangerous to go with one. Uh, you typically have two or three hundred people uh, populating the two ships altogether. They'd be quite small ships by the standards of warships. Often, originally, they had been cargo ships designed for carrying coal because they'd be shallow of draft and very strong. You'd reinforce them. But yeah, you had a large crew, a lot of people to feed. Okay, I'm stepping sideways now in the paper, away from the Arctic, towards the Alps, and still looking at the, the culture of instrumentation, scientific instrumentation. You remember... From the novel, that quotation talked about the air and measuring the air. As you know, it was only in the 1780s that Joseph Priestley had broken air down into its constituent gases, discovered oxygen, carbon dioxide. One of the newest scientific instruments after the 1780s was the udiometer, a new instrument designed to measure what experiment had only recently shown to be true. Joseph Priestley had, in 1774, designed an apparatus and experiment showing that what could not be seen, the air, could be believed. Air was composed of different airs, or gases as we now call them. The udiometer allowed the experimentalist to measure how much oxygen was in the air which was now understood to be changeable and different in different places. In Switzerland, Horace Benedict de Saussure took his udiometer to the culls and summits of Europe's highest peaks. Itself a new activity, men of science had not climbed mountains before. And he went up the mountains to measure whether vital air, the name for oxygen, abounded there or not. Although Saussure found that altitude seemed to make no difference to the proportion of oxygen, he discovered that snow itself created a change. As he recorded in Voyage dans les Alpes, the air evolved from the pores in the snow on the Col du Géant contained less oxygen than the general atmosphere. So the udiometer wasn't sensitive enough to show that there's less oxygen at higher altitudes. But it was able to show that if you get really close to the snow, there seems to be less oxygen in the atmosphere. Later climbers tested Saussure's results elsewhere. So Humboldt took a udiometer up the Andes when he made his climb of Chimborazo in the Andes. Perhaps then, it was the amount of snow depleting oxygen that gave cold regions their dizzying effect on the body, rather than what we now call altitude sickness. It was to test this idea that when William Parry went with his ships to the Arctic in 1823 and 4, and returned to Britain in 1825, he brought a can 
of air with him. Of course, can, canned food was a new technology. The Arctic expeditions were testing this technology. You could take canned food with you, but you could also can air and seal it up. So he brought back some Arctic air to the laboratory at the Royal Institution in London, where it was analyzed by Humphrey Davy and his assistant, Michael Faraday. Faraday found that this air was different. There was, he said, a decided and constant difference between this air from the can and the air of London of at least 1.374%. This difference was attributed by some to the lack of vegetation in the Arctic. There are no trees restoring oxygen to the atmosphere. But they just did not know if the result was correct, nor if it was owing to the amount of snow or to the lack of vegetation or both. The Arctic, you could test it, but you couldn't really come to any reliable conclusions. There's Saussure with his party of men of science on the Alpine Col, clambering over the crevasse on the glacier. You remember in the novel, Victor Frankenstein climbs the Mer de Glace, and there he meets the creature who seems to be able to bound over the crevasses. So I think that it's not entirely a coincidence that there's a major confrontation in the novel between the man of science and his creature on the glacier. Can the man of science tame nature in its extremes up in the Alps? And there is a plate from the Voyage dans les Alpes showing the measuring, measuring station that Saussure set up on the col, the tent the tent hiding his and keeping his equipment safe. Here we are in the Arctic again. Parry's voyage in the Arctic. And here you can see two aspects of a typical scientific voyage in the Arctic. One is scientific experiment. They have set up a chain to record and determine the exact distance between the two ships, supporting the chain horizontally so that they can be sure of accuracy. And they're using that chain to calculate the distance exactly so then they can measure how long it takes to transmit sound over that exact distance and record it in different weather conditions. So they're doing science and recording it with their instruments. But they're also bored because they're stuck there, so they're playing cricket in the foreground <laughs> on the ice. Arctic air defied the eye as well as the ear. Sound was confusing. So was what you could see. There's an enormous iceberg on a clear day. Often the weather is foggy. You're sailing along, not very fast. The fog clears and you discover that iceberg has drifted right next to you that you didn't know was there. We all know about the Titanic. Imagine being in a small wooden ship with that bearing down upon you, unable to see it. It wasn't just icebergs. I'm going to tell you now about the whaling captain and explorer, William Scoresby, very experienced Arctic explorer, something he noticed in the year 1822. He was sailing off the coast of Greenland, scanning the horizon with his telescope. And he found his view fixed on a sight that he knew he should not be seeing. Floating in the sky was an upside down ship. He couldn't see it on the sea, but it was in the air. 
It was, he wrote, so well defined that I could distinguish by a telescope every sail, the general rig of the ship and its particular character, insomuch that I confidently pronounced it to be my father's ship, the fame. It's the name of his father's ship. This despite the fact that no ship was visible on the water. I was so struck with the peculiarity of the circumstance, Scoresby noted, that I mentioned it to the officer on the watch. It's a very typical naval understatement there. What the hell's going on? You're seeing a ship upside down in the air. Stating my full conviction that the fame was then cruising in the neighbouring inlet. Scoresby was correct. The airy phantom not only resembled his father's ship, but was a premonition of it. Scoresby Sr., his father's ship, subsequently appeared over the horizon, floating the right way up on the sea. But they didn't know what was going on. What was this place where you couldn't see a ship on the sea, even with your telescope, but you could see it with your telescope in the sky upside down? That doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. It's confined to the Arctic. But they couldn't understand from their instruments what was going on. And it took the optical expert, David Brewster, many years of collecting observations of this kind and working out the trig trigonom trigonometry involved and what must be happening with reflection and refraction from water and ice to a white clouded sky before he was able to provide a scientific explanation, illustrating it by geometrical diagrams, showing how something beyond the horizon gets reflected and refracted through the air off the cloud and appears upside down in the sky. Utter strangeness on the spot. The Arctic, when you're there, becomes a place where day and night are months long, where the magnetic compass leads one wrong, where icebergs loom out of the fog without warning, where ships appear upside down in the air, not on the water. It's a place of visual and sonic confusion, full of, to use Shakespeare's term, airy nothings that materialize and disappear without warning. To the explorers who were trained in the empiricist culture in which measurement was the means to establish truth, the Arctic was frustrating but also fascinating because of its very resistance to that culture. It became an uncanny place, a place where the very air eluded not only their eyes and ears but also their best instruments. And this is Scoresby again. The general telescopic appearance of the coast was that of an extensive ancient city, abounding with the ruins of castles, obelisks, churches, and monuments, with other large and conspicuous buildings. Some of the hills seemed to be surmounted by turrets, battlements, spires, and pinnacles, while others, subjected to one or two reflections, exhibited large masses of rock, apparently suspended in the air at a considerable elevation of the actual termination of the mountains. The whole exhibition was a grand phantasmagoria. And a phantasmagoria is the magic lantern projection show where you project images so they seem to float in the air, the early ancestor of cinema. Scarcely was any particular portion sketched before it changed its appearance and assumed the form of an object totally different. What a great place for Mary Shelley to stage her creature. Where does one thing end and another thing start? Where does the human finish, the material end, and the ghostly begin? What's air? What's water? What is ice? What is land? Scoresby's a man of science, but this sounds like he is a poet or a playwright or a dreamer. 
hallucination. We'll get to this one in a moment. I'm going to talk now about the Eskimos, the Inuit, and about explorers' encounters with them. So I'm talking now about the missionary to Greenland in the 18th century, David Krantz, Danish missionary to Greenland. He spent a lot of time with the, with the Inuit. For him, the most disturbing aspect of the Arctic air was its ability to confound his empiricism. He discovered the Arctic air could transmit the spirit gods of the Inuit. These gods were manifested as strange traveling sounds made present by the shaman, in the Inuit word, the angakok. This is what Krantz wrote about the shaman and his performances. After he has begun to sing, in which all the rest join with him, he begins to sigh and puff and foam with great perturbation and noise and calls out for his spirit to come to him and has often great trouble before he comes. But if the spirit is still deaf to his cries and comes not, his soul flies away to fetch him. During this dereliction of his soul, he is quiet, but by and by he returns again with shouts of joy, nay, with a certain rustling, so that a person who was several times present assured me that it was exactly as if he had heard several birds come flying first over the house and afterwards into it. But if the Turngak, this is the spirit, comes voluntarily, he remains without in the entry. There are Angakok, the shaman, discourses with him about anything that the Greenlanders want to know. Two different voices are distinctly heard. One as without, that means outside, and another as within. The answer is always dark and intricate. So the Inuit shamans fascinated Krantz because he could not decode their method. He might call them conjurers, but he could not discover how they summoned the spirits into sound and how they made the air come alive. Nay, the very air, he declared, is a vital essence that may be kindled to anger by untoward actions, but yet is kind enough to admit petitioners to ask its counsel. Krantz, as a Christian, he could not believe in the Turngak, the spirit god, but he could not disbelieve either because the sonic presence was so convincing. He found his own religion comparatively powerless in an arctic of aerial punishment and advice achieved through a sonic materialization of morality. So you'd like to be able to dismiss this as ventriloquism. But you can't simply do it because you can't see how the trick is performed and it takes you in. In 1797, another account of shamans in Arctic Canada was published. And this was an important one for Mary Shelley because it was important for Samuel Coleridge. Now, do you know anything about Coleridge's poem, The Ancient Mariner? No? Okay, so I will introduce this poem to you because it's a very important text for Mary Shelley and for the whole Frankenstein novel. But first, Samuel Hearn's A Journey from a Prince of Wales Fort in Hudson's Bay. This was the travel narrative that interested Coleridge. Samuel Hearn was an employee of the Hudson's Bay Company. He was a fur trader. And in the early 1770s, he was led by a party of Cree Indians through the Canadian interior, interior a thousand miles to the shore of the Arctic. He was the only white man in this expedition, and he was dependent upon his Indian companions for survival. He followed their life ways and directions. From this position, he admired the power of shamans' oral performances, and he revealed a society from which belief in the supernatural had not been banished in the name of science and civilization. 
he detailed several incidents in which shamans mobilized the voices of spirits in order to, in order to curse their fellow tribe members who duly died. In Hearn, the Arctic air was materialized as the voice of spirits and it became a means of spiritual enslavement and bodily destruction. So if you're an Indian in this party of Indians and the shaman tells you in the voice of the spirit that you are cursed because you have done something wrong, you believe this and you die. You become so depressed, you believe the power of the curse so much, you become depressed, you stop eating, and in that climate, you die quite rapidly. And so the curse works. Now Coleridge, the poet, drew on these stories in Samuel Hearn's narrative. This is what he said. I had been reading Hearn's deeply interesting anecdotes of workings on the imagination of the Copper Indians. And I conceive the design of showing that instances of this kind are not confined to savage or barbarous tribes. And I conceive the idea of illustrating the mode, the mode in which the mind is affected in these cases. So Coleridge went on to write his poem, The Ancient Mariner, which is a story of a voyage, a voyage that goes badly wrong, and it's told by a mariner who has been cursed by other members of the ship. And the ship then becomes stuck in the frozen regions, in the ice. And it seems to be moved by spirits rather than by the wind. Mary Shelley quotes this poem twice in Frankenstein. She very much bases the Arctic sections of Frankenstein on her readings of this poem, and it's name-checked twice in the novel. She knew Coleridge. He was a friend of her father, so he visited her house when she was a girl. She probably heard the poem recited by Coleridge when she was a girl. Certainly, it was recited on the shores of Lake Geneva when she wrote the novel in 1818, because we know from Byron and Shelley and Polidori's accounts of that summer that the poem was recited. So the poem brings the sonic uncanny of the Arctic home to English civilization. It's a story of an English voyage. So as to demonstrate the power of the irrational, not just among the Inuit, but amongst supposedly enlightened and rational British people. The mariner in the poem becomes a kind of British shaman. The poem says that the mariner hath strange power of speech. And the person he tells his story to in the poem cannot choose but hear. He's mesmerized. And we, the readers, are mesmerized. What we hear in the poem is a story in which the sounds of the Arctic configure the disturbance of mind. The mariner is going mad. The ice was here, the ice was there, the ice was all around. It cracked and growled and roared and howled like noises in a swoon, says the poem. And the tale-telling mariner has oral power like a shaman. His story restages Krantz and Hearn, their description of the spirit that the, the Inuit Angakok summons from the sea. So here's the poem again. Under the keel, nine fathom deep, from the land of mist and snow, the spirit slid, and it was he that made the ship to go. The sails at noon left off their tune, and the ship stood still also. And this is an illustration of the poem made much later by Gustave Doré, the French engraver. There it is in an uncanny Arctic, icebergs all around. So what I want to say about this poem is, its fictional scenario of a ship being moved by the power of spirits, not by the wind, of its 
the mariner being possessed by strange sights and noises in the Arctic. Is that any more weird than seeing an upside down ship in the air, as Scoresby did, or than listening to spirits in the air summoned by the Anglicock, as Hearn did? Where does fiction begin and travel narrative, factual observation end? It's not clear in Courage's poem or in the travel narratives. And that's why the Arctic was powerful for Mary Shelley and why she set much of the novel in the Arctic. Arctic air becomes an uncanny medium for the materialization of spirit, wherein strange and far off noises resonate close to hand. So this poem, for instance, is the first place in English literature where the zombie is described. Again, it's a new figure, the zombie, from the slave islands of the Caribbean. This is the first entrance into fiction. The crew become zombified. They're dead, but they come back to life and they work the ship. In doing so, they utter sounds that seem to come from them, only they're dead. So they're, these sounds are their own and also more than their own. Normal but abnormal at the same time. The zombie crew become like shamans because they voice spirits who utter through them but are not limited by their own bodies. This is what Coleridge says. Sweet sounds rose slowly through their mouths and from their bodies passed. Around, around flew each sweet sound, then darted to the sun. Slowly the sounds came back again, now mixed, now one by one. So clearly by describing sounds like this, almost as if they're birds rising out of the bodies and coming back again, Coleridge asks readers to see what we have no possibility of seeing. One cannot see a sound. Thereby causing us to doubt both the separateness of the senses, this is synesthesia, and their usefulness in comprehending the phenomenal world. This is beyond our sensual power to distinguish. By the climax of the poem, sound is the chief mode through which the supernatural is materialized because it cannot easily be fixed or calibrated or easily translated into measurement. So the poem again, under the water it rumbled on, still louder and more dread. It reached the ship, it split the bay, the ship went down like lead. Stunned by that loud and dreadful sound which sky and ocean smote, like one that hath been seven days drowned, my body lay afloat. So the sound can move the ship, it can sink the ship, it's a material power. Well, as I said, Frankenstein quotes Coleridge's rhyme of the ancient mariner. In the novel, The Polar Voyager, Walton compares himself to the ancient mariner of Coleridge. The ice in the novel plays a similar role to the ice in Coleridge's poem. And both the novel and the poem are related to scientific travel narratives and the frustration and fascination of men of science in the Arctic who want to, but in the end can't, measure their way certainly around this place. So the Arctic becomes the stage, the setting, where the scientist and the explorer, Victor Frankenstein and Walton, meet the limit point of science and technology. It becomes a zone of extremity where science meets its monstrous other, the dark side of its desire to master nature. Victor, of course, meets his creature on the Alpine glacier that Saussure had observed and measures. So let's return now to finish to where I began. The Arctic is the place where Mary Shelley stages the hubris of modern science, where she shows its limits. Victor dies there, unable to catch up with his creature on the ice. The creature, however, flourishes in the Arctic, although we don't know how. He escapes from science's grasp. And it is the strangeness of the air, 
wrenched by shrieks, cracks, thunders and cries that symbolises this, just as it did in Coleridge and before him in Kranz and in Hearn. Walton cannot tell what or whom he hears. What do these sounds portend, Walton asks. It is midnight, the breeze blows fairly, and the watch on deck scarcely stir. Again there is a sound as of a human voice, but hoarser, it comes from the cabin where the remains of Frankenstein still lie. Is this sound a human voice, the voice of the creature, or the strange sound of the cracking ice, or the Arctic wind? The creature is at home in an Arctic where the voices of shamans, human or nature spirits, pass through the air and cannot be measured or located. The world of ice is the uncanny home of science's desire to master nature, a zone where mastery is frustrated and desire is fulfilled in unexpected forms. So finally, to conclude, Frankenstein and the creature are figures created out of the ancient mariner, and both Shelley's and Coleridge's fictions were shaped by what Alpine and Arctic travellers half revealed, that the ice was uncannily desirable as well as alien, because its voices declared the limit point of scientific discourse's explanatory power. The very air, said Krantz, is a vital essence. And there I've finished. Thanks so much for this very uh, suggestive and I would say poetic, uh, poetic talk, not just because you poured it from, uh, from a poem, but I think uh, it was your own, your own, your own voice was uh, very, uh, very poetic, very nice. Um, okay. Um, um, you mentioned you mentioned Bruno Latour at the beginning, and um, it's interesting because I think Latour makes in the in the in the in the framework of um, you know many connections that are made between Frankenstein and contemporary science. We were talking before Franken foods, Franken this, Franken that. He uh, he I think is the is the author of the most interesting or sort of kind of relevant reading, which is that. Uh, Frankenstein is less about the hubris of discovery or creation and so on. Uh, the problem does not come from scientific research, but comes from abandoning one's creation. You know, this is the, 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 the key. Uh, and it's very, his reading is very, uh, is very interesting. And in fact, um, yeah, I just, I just, do you know about this reading? I, I, um, it's in Aramis, uh, or the love of technology, and in, in some shorter some shorter article, and uh, I just found it suggestive in ways that I cannot formulate exactly a question that in the end this abandonment of the creation uh, ends up in this area of you know kind of most intrinsically mysterious uh, uh, or unattainable uh, unattainable unattainable knowledge. Um, it also re makes me realize that um, that landscape disappears completely from, you know, the adaptations of Frankenstein. I mean, it's, it's only one movie that takes one of the recent Frankenstein movies, for example, that that uh, depicts uh, depicts uh, the Arctic at all. It's absolutely nowhere, nowhere else. Also, the figure of Walton disappears completely. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, this is just this this uh, reduction of the um, reduction of the novel to uh, to just you know the doctor and his creature and uh, the mayhem that that um, the mayhem that uh, the mayhem that follows. But um, yeah, I just uh, would like to to grasp better this connection between the nature of the Arctic landscape. And the hubris, because I uh, the scientific hubris, just because I had connected the hubris to the persistence of the alchemical mm -hmm. in Frankenstein's in Frankenstein's quest. Uh, but all of a sudden, after your talk, the Arctic exploration 
uh, comes to embody this hubris in a way that I hadn't uh, perceived uh, before. Can you perhaps say something to this? Well, yes, thank you. Yes, I mean, I think it probably doesn't feature in many of the movie adaptations because it's very expensive <laughs> and difficult to send a film crew up to the Arctic and pretty difficult to make it look in the studio at all realistic. So actually even this movie, which was the 2004 movie, is it? Which has Donald Sutherland yeah. as Walton. Um, it's pretty clear that ship is in a studio. They, the, the, the distant shots are okay, but when they get close up, it's pretty clear it is. So it, it, that's just very difficult to achieve in, in a movie. Uh, I think if you take the Arctic narrative out of Frankenstein, you, you lose a lot because there's this doubling of the, the hubris of the, the man of science in his laboratory it is being mapped against the hubris of the explorer. And uh, yeah, a number of critics have had a anti-colonial, seen an anti-colonialist uh, mm. argument going on there in the novel that science's attempt to conquer nature is directly related in the novel to the attempt to conquer other lands and the hubris of that attempt uh, and how it comes unstuck. And, you know, her father, Mary Shelley, is a big campaigner against the slave trade, for instance, and exploration in the period is so much linked to what we now call global capitalism, which usually depends on the exploitation of native peoples, that might not seem to be the case in the Arctic since there aren't many people there, but actually they're looking for a Northwest Passage so that they can better conduct trade between Britain and India and China, which is of course largely an opium trade. So um, you get that sense of hubris as related to men's desire to conquer. Um, conquer territory as well as conquer knowledge. And that's where I think the, the Latour argument comes in, which is an argument that a number of feminist literary critics have made about the novel, that what we're seeing here is a woman writer's argument against certain kinds of romanticization of male genius as a, as a solitary, particularly male thing, and that Victor is being rebuked by the novel for attempting to be both father and mother, to cut out maternity from nature, the man himself will be able to create now. Uh, there's no female principle involved, and, but he won't play the role of mother towards his own creature. He's very much an absent father, um, not uh, a nurturing father. And so Mary Shelley, who was the child of a major feminist writer, Mary Wollstonecraft, mm -hmm. but who was also born out of the death of her mother, her mother died in childbirth, uh, is offering you a critique of certain kinds of male natural philosophers who ignore the female. And her father was one of those. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, all these things are interrelated in the novel and the myth, I think. And I think that's one reason why Victor has remained a powerful figure in culture, because he's seen to be usurping the female. I had another one. I think that, um, uh, or, or it seems to me, if I, if I remember well, there is a, one of the differences between Walton and, uh, and Victor is that actually Victor, in a way, succeeds. In his, in his quest, whereas Walton is still kind of stuck. And in the end, Victor says, no, don't, don't keep going, you know, look what happened, look what happened to me. Uh, and I was just wondering whether this, is, this also somehow reflects, uh, it seems from, from, what you, from what you told us, that it might reflect this resistance of, um, of the Arctic as a space of exploration and knowledge as contrasted to ex the experimental sciences where the possibility to manipulate uh, actually opens a path of you know, 
of success because there is more control of what one is of one is doing. Yeah. I, I had never I had never thought of it uh, thought of it this way. But your talk uh, brings me to uh, to intuit that this might be a reflection, embodiment, something of what's going on in the science at the time in this respect. Well, I think she's absolutely contrasting the laboratory with the larger field of nature and asking the extent to which power in the laboratory actually does allow you properly to model and produce things that, that will work in the natural world and what the responsibilities outside the laboratory are, yes. Because throughout the novel, Victor's power in the laboratory is set against a wider nature. So yes, at the end of the novel, Walton turns back and says, I'm not going to pursue my quest to get further and further north because I realise that in doing that I'm probably going to not just kill myself but kill the men I'm responsible for and I have a responsibility to other humans so we will turn back and not pursue my egotistical goal at the cost of others. Also in the novel um, Victor shuts himself inside the laboratory and ignores his friend Clerval, and Clerval is very much represents the beauty and sublimity of nature. He goes for walks in nature like Rousseau, Clerval does, uh, and deliberately Victor shuts himself off from that possibility and that link to nature, which is also a link to other people. Clerval wants not to be a solitary walker, but to be a companionable walker in nature. So the world of spring is going on outside, the beauty of nature, and Victor cuts himself off. So yeah, I think there's a, a contrast of inside and outside in the novel. And of course, Walton has his crew, so he's not, he's not alone, although he's the one that's, who's driven by the uh, desire uh, to know, but, uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, but he's, not, he's not alone, in right. co contrast to, uh, to Frankenstein. That's true. Comments, questions? Well then, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.